I don't know. <laughs> Get himself over here. We are live, people. Welcome back to the weekly episode 32. It's been a while, aka a week. And we're here with the show. Uh, joining me and my usual host, starting off with the one and only, the man wearing a sweater, the man ready for fall, Sam, a.k.a. Black Iron Man. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, he was drinking some tea, too, by the way. So you might see him sip some tea there. Oh. And uh, joining us here is Mr. Warren Bowman from BW1.com. All right. Thumbs up. Let's do this quickly. <laughs> yeah, whole show. Ten minutes. Let's do yeah. this. And finally, uh, the man who I didn't see in L.A., the one and only Juan Bagnell. So I'm, I'm old and boring and decrepit, but I had a crazy early call the morning after the uh, Razor event, so I was, I was not able to drag my ass down to go see the new Razor phone. But I did hook up with TK after. And okay. You, know, you got to hang out with TK. Yeah. So by proxy, it was almost like we got to hang out together and talk about that new phone. Which we're yeah, about. I kind of felt it in the ether somewhat, you know. Uh, it was just like my my spirit is permeating. Okay, okay. look, that bullshit is not gonna work. Let's just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's kick it off, guys. A uh, uh, couple of uselessnesses. Uh, first one, which is not on the list, I apologize. I'll add them. Is the fact that um, uh, Google is closing down Google Plus? Is that um, a uselessness? There was a hack. Yeah. Oh, the reason why is definitely a uselessness. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a hack with the no report or address, and we only found out when they said they were going to close it down. Mm. They are closing it, though, which is a good thing. No. no I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Let's, let's be practical here. We Just like every other service, right? There was a hack. They didn't let us know. And um, now they felt like you might as well just close it and just toss it underneath the rug. Uh, I'll start off with you, Juan. What do you what do you think about that level of uselessness there? Uh, it's it's the end to a tragically long saga. I mean, to Warren's point, yes, it's I, at this point it's a good thing that they're just shutting it all down. This it just forced them to do it faster than what they were going to do it anyways. This is a woefully neglected platform. There, every every attempt that they'd made oh. to to making it competitive, like forcing people to use YouTube and combining it with Google Plus, made everything worse. It just goes to show that you, you could be like one of the most profitable and powerful companies on the planet, and you can still fail to figure out how social media works. Um, I, I think the reason why this qualifies as a uselessness and not a relief, though, is. Yet again, companies like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon are going to increasingly find pushback to the relationship between uh, advertisers, the consumers who use their platforms and data security, data privacy issues. And to shutter this, shutter Google Plus because of a massive breach with very little disclosure to the people that were still on Google Plus, to the people that have their Google accounts tied into Google Plus as a, as a platform for activities. Um, and then to not even bring that up while they're showing off security on the pixel is is just a really bad look all the way around. And this is, again, another example of one of these companies that needs to be taken to task for not go. treating this information with the, uh, the attention it deserves. Uh, Sam. I had the wrong window up. I was trying to show something else, and I showed the wrong thing. My bad. <laughs> Hopefully we didn't get to see your browser history. <laughs> no, no. I was just I was trying to show a gif of the of uh, basically Macho Man elbow dropping as 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 a summary of what's happened to Google Plus. Somebody finally finished it off. <laughs> True. But uh Sam, thoughts. Well, uh, it's it's like everything one said, but also the fact that this is Google showing that uh, it would much rather sweep stuff under the rug than address it. Um there was a vulnerability that could have exposed about half a million people. Um, we, we don't know what level of information uh, people had access to. We don't know what kind of information at all was exposed. But Google decided, oh, we're just going to shut Google Plus down. This is a great time to do that because it's, it, it's been shown that even the, uh, even the Google execs haven't used um, Google Plus in years. Or ever. <laughs> this was a dead platform which they forced everyone to use. and then it, it basically gets hacked or has a vulnerability that they kind of hide 
And then instead of telling people exactly what happened, they just basically sweep it under the rug and say, oh, guess what? Google Plus is done. Uh, that's a little bit of a, that, that's a huge fail from Google. And I think even the Senate, I think the Senate, um, what committee is this? Is the Commerce Committee actually wrote a letter to Google telling them that, um, just criticizing them on how they addressed it because Google gave a testimony to uh, the committee and did not mention this vulnerability. They criticized them on how basically they didn't um, let people know about the vulnerability when, when it happened. And you would think that after we've had things like <clears throat> The Facebook hack. After we've had things like the, you know, the credit score. What's it called again? Experian, right? Experian yeah. hack. Google would be a little bit more cognizant of the fact that it's not whether you get hacked or not. It's how you basically communicate this to your users, and they would they just seem to, you know, to not be very, um, <laughs> I would say, sophisticated or aware of the kind of impact this could have, you know, uh, when they don't communicate properly. So. Big feel for Google there. Yep. Uh, Warren? That's so. I think this will sum it up for you. L. <laughs> That's exactly what they are. A giant L on all fronts of this. Not only did they conveniently use this as a way to get rid of, I think, what's a truly a sore spot for them and, and Google+. Plus. I think that this is more like they're pretty bitter about this this whole thing. They didn't disclose it. They try to sweep it under the wrong as fast as they could. And instead of handling it properly, it's just another example of big companies not properly handling people's data accordingly to what it is. And given that, Google Plus tended to have a lot more information than your average uh, social media, specifically like Google Plus could have addresses, it could have job history, it could have full names, phone numbers, all the sorts of things in there, since they were mixing that along with other everything else within your Google profile. No, for, for it, certainly, it, because it, like, think about when you put in a new contact in Gmail. Yeah. Put in that email address, you just get all of the information that was tied to that account through Google Plus. Yeah, just, other people's info. That's even the more important thing, not just yeah. yours. Yeah, and just freely sharing that around and then allowing this hack to sort of happen and sweep it under the rug. This is the reason why they did. It's because they, they, they don't want anybody to really look at this and go, oh, crap, you know, this was this, this is pretty bad because not enough people use Google Plus to even know that that information was there. So... It, it, it's a big L from Google. They can never put out a social network again. This, this is kind of it. Any, any attempts to like, any attempts to like try and like do this again will get sucked up, just like the vacuum that you can hear in the background. <laughs> there. Um, yeah, no, that, that's very true. But I, I want to kind of move quickly. We move to Facebook, and the fact that we realized that their latest uh, hack. Um, uh, resulted in 29 million uh, users' information exposed. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is the previous hack that they just mentioned recently that um, had a lot of people exposed, and 50 million in general exposed. Um, uh, in terms of handling, do you like the handling? Because, again, this is a hack that happened recently. Facebook announced it as soon as possible. At least I will put it that way. And then they've now come out to say that, yeah, there were 29 million users um exposed i do know on my facebook because um my i had to reset my account that they each time i log in i get a pop-up at the very top that keeps telling me about whatever is happening or things that i need to do and things like that i just wonder what your experience is what you guys think about the fact that it was this you know the at least 29 million users info was exposed and how facebook is handling it i'll start uh, off with uh, Ooh, uh, with, mm. with Sam. Oh. Sorry, Warren. <laughs> was like me, me, me. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, I, I think it was handled well. Um, Facebook did a great job communicating exactly what happened. And that shows that Facebook basically, maybe it's not good guy Facebook, but Facebook is aware of the amount of scrutiny that um, is on it right now. So it is in your best interest to be as transparent as possible. Now, this turned out that it's not as bad as initially thought. They thought it was 50 million before. Yeah. Uh, now it's only 29 million. So yes, it's not as bad as originally thought, but it's still 29 million people. 
you know? So, um, yeah, they handled it well. They, you know, they communicated clearly. They were good to basically, um, I guess they, they forced people to, to change passwords. They made, they, they, they made people aware of exactly what was going on. And for that, I'm like, okay, good job, Facebook. The problem is, you know, Facebook wants to be the guardian or the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the consolidation of all your social information, they need to do better because this is not the first time a breach has happened. This is not the last time it would happen, but you just need to be a lot better in securing people's data. Warren, it's now your turn. Well, I think they did a good job with this as best as you could. And somebody that deals in IT and type of, the, you know, these types of hacks hacking all the time, there's never going to be 100% um safe solution for that and it's, it's not going to be anything really f totally foolproof you have to well, I have an idea. i'll tell you guys you have to be online if you're going to be online you're going to be on facebook you're going to do those things you're going to understand that hacking and these things are going to be a part of this world and one you have to hold these companies accountable to proactively and constantly be protecting your data accordingly and inform you of these things that are happening and to, to give you the tools to protect yourself as best as you possibly can as well, too. Because really, the only safest way you can ever be from things like hacking is to, one, never put it online, and two, unplug the network cable from your phone, from from the back of your PC, and put your put all your other devices in airplane mode and never go online if you really want to be that fully protected. But even, that, the, even, protection, in airplane, even in airplane still, mode, you can be you, tracked. You can yeah. still read the electromagnetic signal from your screen, and they can use that to basically reconstruct the image on your screen. I'm telling you, man. Zoom in, enhance. The government. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been watching too much Black Mirror. No, actually, that, that, that's a fact. That they can, they, it can be done. And this has been, you've been able to do that since what? Since How likely they care about you to do it. Exactly. Yeah. That's the whole point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, getting back to Facebook, they, um, I think they handled this the best they could. They immediately um, remedied the issue, announced it, already announced that they had the remedy for it, and then proceeded afterwards to tell you the, the sort of the results of the outcome or sort of the final information about it. That's kind of a standard way of going about things when these type of things happen um, is, is information has to be released at a certain pace. And it, and I think they did a good job of, of of doing those type of things. One of the things I wish they would push more is telling people to two factor authenticate their damn Facebook accounts and profiles and stuff like that. They don't do that enough, and they should be pushing that more to further lock down accounts, prevent people from from getting hacked, and and. And, and and so on. So I think they did a good job with it, but I wish they would push more and telling people how to better lock and lock themselves down more, which I think is what they're not pushing enough of yet. Juan. Yeah, uh, Sam and Warren have, have summed this up really well. If we look at Facebook's previous behavior and we look at the, the threats that have faced this platform, I think that this is about as best an outcome as we could have hoped for, for Facebook jumping into this and trying to, to rectify the situation. Um, to Warren's point specifically, um, this is another example of a situation where it would be nice if we could shift how we do business on the internet away from everything being ad supported or ad based so that your data is the product that Facebook sells. Um, like we said, we were talking about last week, I forget exactly how it came up, but you know, it would be interesting to see if we could create like a tier of the internet where I could pay Google for all of these awesome services and completely opt out of being the data that they sell you know if we if we could re-examine our relationships with these kinds of companies because i think in our current state we're going to find that this is an ever losing battle like you cannot win this fight every single data breach every single exploit every single um situation that a facebook or a google or an amazon runs into they're going to face because their business model depends on their security being purposely leaky. And, it, and it's going to depend, their business model depends on consumers not really having easy access or taking advantage of the tools necessary to properly safeguard their data. I think we ultimately completely lose that fight. You know, Facebook cannot win that fight. They can't police all of the content that's going up on their 
on their service and they can't properly lock down everyone's accounts because their business model depends on that account being, you know, full of holes. So until we change our relationships with these companies and we change our expectations that everything needs to be for free, well, when everything is for free, we are the product. We are the information that uh, that's being uh, packaged and sold to other companies. And we are the data that will be accessed by bad actors in this space. So I mean, just like with Google, uh, you know, disclosure, better tools, better protections. We want that, but we don't want it enough to give up on some of the ease of use, the convenience and the price tag of the big zero dollar price tag that comes with interacting with Facebook. Well, there's a lot of things that are being developed that are trying to go away from the things. One of the things Google actually internally the, um, actually went away from passwords themselves on their own account and started using these key fobs to be able to connect and they haven't had a breach since then. So there are there are steps that that are being developed around uh, more higher security with easy use linked on on, on to the thing. Two factor authentication doesn't affect anybody other than you just got to hit a code to get in. But it's it, I think that's more so teaching people how that works. And I don't think anybody actually does that out of any of the sites that have ever two factored before. They don't actually tell you how to do that. So if, right. you, if, they, don't, if they don't visibly put it in front of you, they'll people will never know. Therefore, they won't lock themselves down yeah. in that manner. Will that matter? Will that matter in, in an instance if, if if the data gets leaked out or not? Most likely not. That's because that because that, that really all depends upon how tight Facebook's own security is on their on on their end of protecting you. But right. you protecting yourself. But but, but what, I, what I'm talking about is in 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 leaving it up to the consumer to protect themselves when they've sort of been trained by these companies to do business under stock settings, right? You know, look, look at your terms of service and your agreement with Google where turning off location tracking doesn't really turn off location tracking. Oh, yeah. We've always been totally clear about when you disable GPS on your phone that you're not really disabling GPS on your phone. Like we can't, we can't just keep leaving it up to these mega corporations that have every interest in, um, perpetuating a business model to also be the only way that we can safeguard data and protections. I think the legislation that just went up in California is ham fisted and sloppy um, when it comes to IOT. Like we passed legislation here in California in the last days of Jerry Brown's tenure to require that when a company sells some sort of smart home device, it either has a unique password, not a generic password out of the box, or as part of the setup process, it requires the company to force the user to come up with a unique password. That's the kind of step that we need to encourage these corporations to engage with. When you sign up for your Facebook account, or when, to when you log into your Facebook account after some type of major breach like this, you need to lead the user by the nose because they're not going to change their behavior on their own. They're going to try and find the most abbreviated path to just getting back into their Facebooks. We can't let Facebook be the arbiter of what your value, what your personal data is worth, what your compromised data is worth, and how to best protect that data. That needs to be up to the user, and it needs to be forced in some kind of discussion, which ideally shouldn't come from the government. But if Facebook isn't going to do it for themselves, then unfortunately, the only other recourse we have is some kind of government intervention. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's the thing, right? I think we've mentioned this several times in the show. Like, if these companies cannot police themselves, if these companies do not have proper protocols for when these things happen, I don't know what's stopping Google, Facebook, Apple, and all the other big companies from going out there and saying, we're going to start a corporation that basically its sole purpose is to secure data across all our networks. Those they, already exist. They're just not forced to use it like the financial institutions are. Those yeah, already exist. Almost every financial, if you want to work in, and if you want to work in, in especially a hedge fund, private equity, or anyone else, you have to go through third-party security exactly. audits. That's what I'm saying. And I don't know what's, not, forcing, what's stopping these companies. from The government has not forced them yet. And that's government. the problem. If they yeah. don't, forced them yet. if they don't basically police themselves, then yes, this is the role of the government to come in and protect the consumers at the end of the day. So that's exactly what's going to have to happen. And, that's, and we're already seeing that right now. 
Mm -hmm. We're already having hearings. And the next thing we're going to have is basically people are going to start discussing the fact that these companies are doing so many different things that they need to start getting broken up. And it's going it, to regulation is going to come down. And my fear is that this is going to stifle innovation. So it's really not going to be the government's fault when we can't do certain things on the internet anymore. It's going to be the Facebooks, Googles, Amazons, and Apples of the world with your continual breaches doing nothing whatsoever to basically secure consumer data in a way that basically makes it impossible for people to hack. It's it's, it's, it's just really going to be their fault. <laughs> well, so oh, it's, yeah. it seems like, according to Sam, Microsoft is free on this one. I'm not saying oh, it. Come on. I just forgot, I just <laughs> forgot just to mention hey, Microsoft. You didn't mention Microsoft. The guys at Microsoft are like, whoo, whoo, so break this <laughs> news. We're number anyway, one. Guys, We're number one. <laughs> we, should, we should move on to our, ne our next topic because um, there were a couple of big announcements this week. Um, starting off with Google finally showing off officially the device that has been leaked more than any other device this year. Okay, I got about five minutes before I gotta head out. Let's make this quick. Let let let, let Warren just go. Let yeah. Him just go. So so the 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 Pixel three yeah. and Pixel three XL. We plus, already know what you're talking about. Just let no, Warren. No no no. Plus plus they also had some other devices as well. So Warren, your thoughts? Not gonna lie, the most interesting thing was that display, four hundred and fifty bucks. That little Google Hub thing. Yeah. Far more interesting than the phones were the phones. They what they were. They matched everyone else's spec. Everyone complained about the notch up at ad nauseum. Every video will complain about it and act like it's the worst thing on planet Earth. Let's get over it, people. Notches exist. That's just what's going to happen because only two people control hardware direction in this world. And it's Apple and Samsung. And until somebody else gets out there and does it, it's just not going to change anything. So deal with what it is um, and, and to, and, and, until until the market changes around. Uh, the, the I think they'll I think the device is a Priced decently well. Um, I wish they had more storage on them since you can't add, add additional storage to it, but Google's all about the cloud and throwing everything up to there, so that's not surprising that it's there. Um, the display, the whole, whole Google Home Home display was really the most interesting thing I think they put up there because for 149 bucks, it does pretty much everything the Lenovo display does outside of you know video chat. Although it, it is it is much yeah. smaller, though. It's, it's, yeah. it's a really small device from yeah. what people have said. I haven't actually seen it. Yeah, it's pretty um, uh, on the small side, but it should be pretty good. Um, we'll see when that kind of comes up. And that, that's kind of my thoughts on it. All right, cool. All right, so Warren has run through. And whenever you feel like leaving Warren, uh, let us know. But right. thank you. Um, Sam, Hey, what do you think? What do you think about the the, the pixels? Um, the I, pixels. I, I, I actually am a little, uh, I, I really don't like the XL. Um, I don't like the XL because I don't know if it's worth the hundred bucks more. Is what was it? Two hundred bucks more? Um, when all you're getting is a bigger battery and a notch <laughs> and a bigger screen, really, but a notch. Like, really, is it worth it at that point? Because I'm looking at the at, at the the regular Pixel Three, and it has almost every single feature that's going to be actually I shouldn't say yeah almost every single feature that's going to be on the Three XL. It has a bigger screen and a bigger battery. Yeah, the battery uh, and the display resolution I think are the only two different things uh, yeah. between those two devices. So, so you, you still get all the software features that's going to have the uh, what I'm going to call I don't remember what the name is, but the anti uh, oh, what's it called. Uh, Tele telemarketer <laughs> features on there, which I think is going to be awesome. Which um, one? Basically, where you can answer where it answers your phone, so you don't have to answer it, and it basically tells you what you're saying. And if you want to answer, you just pick it up. Oh, so cool! I can stop getting that spam phone call and getting yeah. custom in Chinese. No, no, it's but pretty cool. I mean, but it it still answers the phone for you, right? It doesn't actually answer it per se. It's basically their AI talking to this person, and it's you have a readout on your screen. And if they say something interesting, or if it's a real person, you can just pick it up. I mean, it, I, I, I get, but you can just let it run if you don't want to deal with it. No, <laughs> no, no. I'm awesome. I, I, no, I, I do like that aspect. It's just that uh, we already have that on the device. Not, not that we have the fact that I can see who's calling me, and I'm, I don't even I, like. I don't well, see what the problem is. But, but the thing that bothers me about that is that that is a server side solution for spam, and yeah. I pay for Project Fi. Yep. So I don't get that. It should be online. rolled out everywhere. It really should. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like I'm giving Google money for the backbone service that enables me to use to have phone calls and stuff. 
and and we're looking at probably getting Maria Moto, and we we won't get that because that's a pixel service. This is one of the frustrating things about talking about pixels is separating the phone from software where software could be ubiquitous for all of the Google and Oh yeah, in, you're very right. In terms of hardware, this is the least exciting hardware you can you can think of. Software wise is where they are, but you're right. This should be across every single Android device because it's Oh there. yeah, it, it, it oh, should yeah. be. Okay. And, and and the thing that really even even really makes it worse is the fact that you start looking at other features like the camera and how much they do they're they're doing server side on the cam uh, on the basic processing as well and all the other stuff and you're like uh you can really give all of this <laughs> no, 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 the camera no, no, no. the camera they can keep that i'm, I'm happy no, no, i'm yes. saying all the features there all the software features they have they really could give it to all well, the machine it, he's talking about the machine AI learning uh, i learned yeah, i no, think no, eventually no. that will be a thing because they're just gonna there's nothing there's no amount of cameras you could put on a phone that's going to beat that out there just isn't no the there, there, there is because this camera does one thing very well portrait mode low light is still grainy as shit Okay, and the but video the, is the not online processing. Good. It's still pretty good. Did you, did you see the image? Um, the the image they took, the low light image they took. My friend, I took a bloody image of this <laughs> thing yesterday. I mean, it's good, did, but did it go to the cloud and process it properly? Yes, the P twenty Pro were you to the cloud. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to to that point, if we're talking hardware to hardware, this this will not move the needle on any P twenty Pro owners in the very same yeah. way that. Um, I'll be talking about it at the end of this podcast, but I finally wrapped up my iPhone uh, 10s camera review. It's 30 minutes of digging into these samples. And um, computational photography can get you a long ways. You yeah. can do some really exciting things, but you're still never really going to unseat a hardware advantage like a substantially larger image sensor. It's You just can't beat physics yet we're on the road there eventually you will oh well, google is it's not right they're now. gonna find that way it's not right now but as long <laughs> as that machine i can keep learning and learning and everyone up to uh, keeps uploading their photos to google photo for free because they give you free storage for it and they can keep totally. learning and learning over and over again they're gonna beat everyone and that's just yeah. what it's going to be but I, don't think that, I, see, I, I disagree i disagree but i don't on think that. they're gonna be on, yeah i don't think you're gonna beat phone. everyone in that sense because at the end of the day it's it's also the there's also calculation is how do you get these sensors better how can you move us to a slightly larger sensor because when you combine both yes but think about but think about that as the sensors get better in the smaller packages they can add that to their phones plus a that comes out with it yeah but but they're then, gonna beat everyone but too. Look, at what, look at what huawei did right Huawei of all companies just came out with a sensor and just smoked everyone. Not you know every uh, Google had AI last year. It was like okay, this is the best camera. Why was like here's the P20 and we went. Jesus, thank you. That's what yeah, happened. I'm when saying you, you do yeah, hard okay. Work. That's now. I know, that's but now. But I'm saying down the line. I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about three, five years from now. It's gonna get smoked. Also, it's it's the same. Look, it's the same thing. You're talking software side. I'm talking hardware side. The win is the middle. Is when both of them come together. Right, that's where the win is, and until Google decides to actually play in the hardware side more, they will still keep doing because it's a it's philosophy aspect. Their philosophy is, I mean, which is why the design of the phone is the same. I mean, it's polished, but it's the same. And the design of the phone, the design of the phone is the same. Is because they attract I iPhone users with it. That's and, why the design of the phone and, is the and, same. And and the laziness of the notch, they could not even explain that. Sorry, Juan, I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I, just, I just, <laughs> I, 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 you haven't said anything I've disagreed with, so. Yeah. I, but I got, I got to take off, guys. All right, all right, man. All I'll right. see you guys later. Take, take it easy. They, they didn't, they didn't explain the notch. They didn't actually explain why. I thought maybe they were going to go the same route as Apple with the facial recognition, right, which requires more sensors. No, so I, I, I can I think that's, buy that. That's actually, to your point, I think that's actually worth digging into just a little bit. I think. I, I didn't want to just sort of front load this episode because I knew we were going to be talking about this, but I kind of feel like the entire press event was a baby uselessness. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean that seriously. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't get to go in person. Unfortunately, I'm just working too many jobs here that I can't turn down because I like paying rent and eating food um, <laughs> to go and travel and celebrate Google on my own dime. Um, when they start off a press event by taking shots at youtubers 
who have been talking about pixel leaks and then acting like they've got some big reveal. Oh, oh they yeah. Know everything just mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And then they had nothing. They had yeah. nothing to back that up. So all they did was take shots at YouTubers at the beginning of their press conference with nothing to disclose that we didn't already know about yeah. the phone. I was hoping to hear something new about just the, pick the regular Pixel 3 without the notch or whatever. Like, oh, wow, and it's a full screen on the front. Oh, my God. And nope, that, no, they, that they completely <laughs> ran away from discussion of things like design. Because they didn't even disclose the price of the XL in the press event. Mm -hmm. Pixel 3 starts at whatever, what is it? Starts at $800. Yeah. Yeah, it's, for the smaller. It, yeah, I think, yeah, it, you are right. Seven no disclosure, no detailing, no pricing above that. Just the starting price right there. Because this phone has already been talked to death, death. in the enthusiast space. So what was the point? You're in the middle yeah. of this People press already conference. Done full reviews with the actual phone. <laughs> well, but we're in the middle of this press conference, and they'll be talking. And the, the presenters would be talking about features, and then just kind of shrug, <laughs> like there was no excitement for what they were trying to talk about, for what they were trying to show off. And then they would just go into like in the middle of it for um for the 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 smart display, whatever it's called. They just did a setup guide. They basically just walked us through the setup and first use of that product like the least interesting way to disclose to, to, to yeah, exactly Th this this was a terrible presentation from top to bottom google i think just further demonstrated for me how ineffective they've been at building an apple or even a surface style hardware ecosystem if, if, if that had been my experience, if I were thinking about switching ecosystems, like moving from iOS to Android or moving away from Galaxy phones to consider a Pixel, that would have left such a sour taste in my mouth. Why would I want to do business with this company for any kind of hardware? I mean, you do make a very good point. Granted, I wasn't there at the Pixel event, but you I mean, the one thing, you know, we talked about it with Panos, right, is we know Microsoft was doing a refresh. AKA it's not sexy to do a refresh because they're very expected. Right. We also heard that there was no USB type C, but uh, the way he presented it, right. was, this is your life. This is what you want, you it's know, aspirational, aspirational. And I, like I said, I was there going, man, I mean, I know there's no type C, but shit is my cool though. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, you sell me on the field. You got yeah, sold on the field. Sell me on it. I get it. You know, it's the same thing they should have done here. We, it's been leaked to death, but you know, uh, go to that photography aspect that you're, you've you done so well, right? And sell why this camera is for your life, why your everyday is captured, you know, those kind of things. And not just, mm -hmm. oh, we can do this with these numbers. It's almost well, like... And look, and look at what Google did. You, you want to talk about cameras specifically, they literally did the side-by-side, -side, our phone is better than the iPhone camera. And I will give, I will give TLD credit for this because I saw his video and he went... Okay, I know that's a pixel, but that is not an iPhone XS shot because that that is just too dark. I don't, I don't know what that is. Like the way the but, it was framed was but, just. But regardless, let let's even take because we know that they always play like they play the absolute too. best example of a photo from our phone and the absolute worst way that you could get a photo from an iPhone. Let let's just take that off the table. Google can't even figure out an argument for why their phone should stand alone. Like every time, I mean, like I think Samsung commercials are funny, but I think it does a disservice to Galaxy fans when you constantly compare your product to the iPhone because I think it just legitimizes the iPhone as the standard. Yeah, I mean that that does their phones against. Every time you do something like that, you basically cede the ground to Apple. You basically give Apple exactly the kind of marketing credibility that they that they claim when they, they go out to say that their product is the best of whatever tier that, that, that they're working in. If Google can't figure that out, what are we doing here? Like, wh what are we talking about? We're talking about a couple nifty software tricks, hardware, which really hasn't evolved beyond the Nexus with chipset bumps, and that's it, and higher and higher price tags to accomplish the basics. Why am I spending $800 for a slightly smoother experience of just covering the basics. This is getting silly. Well, it's even worse when you, when, when you think, because I think someone was asking how much is the Pixel 2 now? When, when you realize that for what, 
$200 less. I think the Pixel 2 is $599 now, right? For $200 less, you could probably get a device that would probably keep you over for another year or two and could probably do all the things that, all the software tricks that this phone can do. Then you're like, oh, okay, now we see why Google is basically keeping the software to the Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3 XL, because if it does release it across all Android devices, it really doesn't have an argument for why you should buy these new devices. Yeah, well, I, I think this would definitely go to one of the points Warren was making, especially when it came to wearables and the such, is that we're gonna see a further bifurcation of what features land on a pixel and what Android gets in the rest of the ecosystem. I think we're going to see a, a starker fracturing there because Google is priming us for fuchsia. Yep. Google is priming us for a completely closed up, more iPhone like clo uh, 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 walled garden ecosystem to, to walk back some of the issues that they've been having with Android. That's the only thing that makes sense to me is you start positioning this now with a couple fun little calling features, some software improvements for the camera. And then once you make that transition over, you you get to you have to point to Fuchsia is this new thing now. This is how Google's going to do business. And if anyone wants to make Fuchsia, it needs to look exactly like this. Yeah. I, I don't even know if they're going to. Do you think they're going to let other people um, dabble in the future in the Fuchsia um, ecosystem? No, they're, they're going uh, to. I don't think they will. I think it's going to be like Wear OS. Yeah, it'll be like Wear OS. The most you can do is you can have an app that does, you know, app type things, you know, that you want to segment in, but you are going to be not like Wear OS, like locked out, which is what has, I think has pissed off a lot of manufacturers because they were, Google, I think Google promised them, um, not variety, but they promised them something that was going to be updated constantly that will add a lot of new features uh, as well. So you don't have to do it. We'll do it for you. And then they haven't received any of that. And they can't even add that themselves because it's, it's closed, you know? So uh, I yeah, think that's, I completely that's where it is. Yeah. Anyway, so there was the Pixel, there was the, no one talked about the Pixel Slate, the Surface Kit. Never mind. Um. <laughs> no, I mean, sir, but but I actually I I, I want to ask the because uh, you know while while Warren was saying you know, like he was really digging on that screen, I found a lot of people on Twitter who were kind of pissed off about Google mandating specific hardware like cameras on other smart displays and then backtracking from it on their own, acting like they were the purveyors of your privacy. And video calling is kind of, I mean, like, I use an Android tablet when I want to Skype or when I want to call and hang out with my family and I want Lex to be able to run around and talk to relatives and stuff like that. I, I, I can pick up a cheap Android tablet and just leave it in my kitchen. And then it's not a base computer. It's something I can pick up and interact with and move around and move it from a kitchen really easily to another part of the room. You know, like th there, I already have this solution. So that then when they switched over to the uh, to the Chrome, what is it? The Pixel Slate? Is Pixel Slate, yeah. Pixel, Pixel Slate. Slate. Do we think that Android, do we think that Google can crawl back into a tablet discussion now? Google kind of gave up on Android for larger screens. This Do is you more think that they can come back with Chrome OS. Yeah, I mean, I think they can. I think they can. This is this is a this is a, a Surface Play, right? Because you can get keyboards for it. You can basically get like a folio for it. You can get a pen for it. So this is this is a Surface Play, and I think they could dabble in this market. I think they can. I think they made a mistake of launching this device with the Pixel. I really think that, granted, you know, there were some people who talked about it and said, this looks nice, I'm very interested. I think they should have taken the playbook from Surface and made it a true just event for. This is why, because the thing about Chromebook is not just the hardware, it's also the fact that there are many people like me who go, why am I using a browser? I still don't get it. Like, what's the point? So they need an event where they either have that device uh, and either a slew of the other, all the cheaper devices and say, this is the pinnacle of what Chrome OS should be with the Pixel Slate. Everybody can copy this. Our OEMs can do what they need to do. And here are some entry-level points. And this is why it's so good for you. Because the problem with Chrome OS is not the fact that it, it, they have, they always had solid hardware. They've had an i5. Even some of the cheaper ones have like quite three i5s in there. It doesn't need it. It's the fact that people ask the question, why am I using a Chrome browser? 
till they actually figure that out, then that's where it will change. And I think also doing stuff where it's separate also and adding project, um, the game streaming project they just announced, yeah. you know, that you're streaming Assassin's Creed, the latest one on your Chrome browser. That is something that if you did an event solely, you could have hyped and put it together. And I went, yeah, oh, how disappointing that that wasn't a part of this train wreck of a presentation, because that is that that is generating so much positive buzz. Like, um, do you guys listen to Jeff Kanata's gaming podcast? DLC? No. Like they went off on it for almost an entire episode. So they were really reviewing Assassin's Creed, but a huge chunk of the conversation. Well, what's, what's it called again? Project? I, uh, I can't remember what the, the game streaming service is. It's just their game streaming service. But um, that this could be the, the 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 Netflix for gaming that we've wanted, and especially for people who might have been pushed out of nicer games experiences because of console prices or gaming PC prices, like 60 frame per second, decent graphics. If you have a, a fast internet connection, you're playing Assassin's Creed. And that you don't install anything, you don't load anything. The transitions don't take nearly as much time as they take on an Xbox when you're going through different game modes and you just play the game. I care about fidelity and I care about having a beast of a PC and I care about having cool boxes connected to my TV screens. But there's something really compelling about sort of leasing a high quality gaming experience through some sort of Netflix like service. Like I've kind of gotten over the need to have the highest 4K fidelity when I watch movies because Netflix is just so much more convenient. It's more convenient than dealing with Blu-rays. This this is a huge step towards making that happen. I, for gaming. I just like, signed Google up for the didn't service. talk about it at <laughs> all. Yeah, I mean, I'll share the link for you guys, but I want to ask this question, especially because that's this is the next race for next year. Microsoft will start invites in spring for. Uh, Project Cloud, X Cloud. Um, we've got NVIDIA who already started invites for theirs uh, earlier this year. We, we've got, and we know that PlayStation is going to be working on something for on PS5. something else. Yeah, and then and then we've got um, um, Google with this one as well. I it will be very interesting to see how it all pans out um, all around. Uh, I think I think. Google has a nice play, especially the way you described it. But I think also, I personally think that they will not succeed um, just because it is limited to, uh, I don't know. I think it's, I think it'll be limited to Chrome, but I also think that because it's because of that, it will be harder to play on your phone. I just oh, think. No, 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 no. This, this is the first step because it, it's not just that it's limited to Chrome. This is still a premium experience because it's limited to a fast internet connection. Mm -mm. Like you need at least a 20, a 20, least a 20, a 20, 25 megabit down sustained, not burst. Oh, sustained. no, no, no. Oh yeah. It's, it's the same across the board for all the other services because I so, tried NVIDIA. So I personally think Google is Google's going to deliver on this because if that's the thing Google does well, <laughs> Google does well when they basically have like a service, an online service that you're trying to push. They do that well. And See, then they screw it up later on, yeah. but they See, do it which well. Is, which is my bet here is it's either NVIDIA or Microsoft. I pick Microsoft because right now online gaming works well because of one thing they have, Azure mm -hmm. servers. That is running about 60% of every, Fortnite is, a, that's this, the only reason why that works so well. Automatically eliminates some of the huge uh, talking points about like console power. Mm -hmm. when, when you're running server side and you're already targeting people that have the disposable income for a game subscription service, a nice TV and a fast internet connection, then Xbox as a service. I mean, that's something I've been talking about for a while. There's no reason to buy an Xbox but you can make which is why they started Xbox as a service already. <laughs> Xbox as a service, exactly. Yeah. And especially with like the way that they've been incorporating Xbox services into Windows 10. So my 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 take on this would be Google can do this first, but while consumers have been primed to utilize and trust Google services, they don't pay for any of them. Yeah. And I don't know that Google can do this as another one of their free services you would need to charge for this kind of rack space for this yeah. kind of processing power and that's something that microsoft sony 
Nintendo, Steam, Valve, all of these companies have already trained yeah. their consumers to pay up front for this kind of stuff. And I think that's actually Google can be first, but I think we'll have plenty of time for a Microsoft, a Sony, everyone else in the industry to catch up. And then once you can get like a Microsoft game streaming service on Android, that instantly kills whatever Google might be trying to I try to do. Their own I, I want to try There's another company called Shadow. I've been seeing the ads on um, Instagram about same same thing. Same they they announced when Nvidia announced theirs, and now it's you can actually pay for the service while Nvidia is still Nvidia is running as beta because I guess they, they just want that data so that they can actually build it out. I want to see how that is, but yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. No, I, I, I think part of this is not just. Um, you know, being able to stream games and play games. I think part of what they're trying to do also is to corner, um, get inroads into that market that Amazon basically owns right now, which is Twitch, right? Twitch, you have to have your system, you have to have all these things in order to stream your game. With the way this is looking with Google, um, what's it called, stream service, or what's it called, Google Project Stream, and the NVIDIAs, it looks as though you'd be able to do these and stream your game while without ha having to have the hardware at home oh, and yeah, that true. basically cuts the cost of entry um to like a a, a twitch kind of um, uh ecosystem so uh, hey it, it's i think it's really the wild west right now in terms of streaming services and gaming hardware um people are really changing the conversation but it would be worthwhile to see like one said are people going to pay for a google service can they deliver this with 1080p 60 frames per second um with a 20 up and down um you connection know, yeah connection or can they do it with less what what would be your upfront cost to be able to enjoy a, a gaming experience using a streaming service no, I would agree. And uh, speaking of gaming experience, you know the boys at Razer had a brand new announcement this week. <laughs> the Razer phone. And look at that. Chroma baby. I'm really, Chroma. really sad I couldn't make it that. Yes, this is the brand new Razer phone. Um, as the as the CEO call, Ming calls it, flagship gaming. Um, and I'll put it this way: when I first met Razer for the briefing on this device, I walked in. I said, "It looks the same." Convince me. That's what I said. You jerk. <laughs> I had to. Um, and so the, the, just go through some of the specs in there. It's 845, as you expect, 8 gigs of RAM. The display is improved. Last year's display was not as bright. Um, it's now up to about 640 nits, 50% uh, brighter um, with the display. The speakers also were not as loud. And it is also about, I would say, 30% Allowed up to 103 decibels is what they they stated. It's, uh, isn't it Dolby Atmos certified? It's, it's Dolby Atmos certified as well. Um, I have a speaker test coming, so don't worry. You see that one there. Uh, the battery is a 4,000 milliamp battery. Uh, they do have chroma lighting at the back, which you can use for notifications as well. Why didn't they have that on the freaking first one? <laughs> Sorry, just, just had to say that. Um, and then in terms of uh, other software features, they have the Razor Cortex, which you can actually set the speeds of your processor, kind of like a little bit overclocking, if you will, because your processor doesn't run at the max clock speed anyway, all the time. You can set all your games, those kind of things in there. Uh, the display is 120 hertz, and it is butter smooth. That is something that still, you know, it's really interesting to see. Now, it also has those lifestyle features. You've got water resistance uh, IP67. Uh, dust resistance. You also have um, wireless charging. They've got a wireless just charging Chroma charging pad. So for all your all your Chroma needs, you can just fully rack it up with this device. Uh, and the pricing is seven ninety nine. And they have new cameras using Sony sensors, Sony's class sensor for this year, uh, twelve megapixels. OIS also included on the main sensor. So they've done all the things that you would expect from a flagship device. My question is. Um, at least from what you heard, uh, what do you think about it? I know you haven't actually tried the devices, but do you like where they've positioned themselves, if you will? Oh, I, I went hands-on yesterday. So okay. I, I right. like I dragged TK to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> like, give me the damn phone. Um, and he let me play with it. Um, first of all, absolutely adore the hardware build. It feels 
phenomenal in the hand. And and I hate it when YouTubers make that kind of it's too big. You know, like, it feels really good in the hand. You know, it feels good. Like, like our phones used to be made out of razor blades and rusty rebar, <laughs> right? But Razer is making a claim. Razer is making a claim that this can be a phone which elevates mobile gaming. And when you put it in your hands, it has a good heft to it. And I really like that it has forehead and chin bezels with speakers. It's not that it's just space. But your thumbs reach over easier than when you try and game on an all screen device like my OnePlus 6. The OnePlus 6 is a screamer. Nothing's slowing down this phone, but it is not fun to play games on this when you're reaching out to the corners and the edges of your display. Now, Razer has delivered on exactly their claim of ergonomics and that that's not just dead space that is used space for a premium a higher quality audio experience for when you're consuming that gaming when you're consuming that media i love every step that razor has taken with that former nextbit team keeping a design language that's accessible that's edgy that's bold that doesn't look like any other phone on the market today They've maintained that sense while adding those little razor touches, which should have been on the first phone, like chroma lighting. And they're bringing it into all of the specs that we would expect to have on a 2018 phone. I'm just I'm just waiting for final software and I'm waiting to see what what you can actually pull out of the Qualcomm 845 at the end of the year. As we all know, we're getting ready to start looking at refreshes in the first third of 2019. So the timing on this is a little sensitive. This is a little precious for Razer, but so far, every single point that they've made, I they've made a good argument for why their phone is the niche phone that it is. If you're if you're looking at this going, let's go, well, you can just get some other phone that's like a general all-rounder, or like you could get like a Sony if you like boxy phones, then you're missing the point out of what Razer is trying to accomplish here. If you don't care about a faster refresh rate screen, then immediately just this move isn't, this isn't yeah. move, move along that they're making a specific argument and that makes me way more excited than a company trying to make yet another generic all-rounder does everything kind of well kind of phone i want companies to look at a demographic and say we will make the best device for you here we just have to accept that there might be compromises somewhere else razor has now done that for a second generation, we should be taking this product more seriously. Mobile gaming could be primed for something really interesting over the next year. And now we have a true gaming hardware manufacturer investing even more resources, resources into it. This is where we start examining that claim for real, as opposed to just pretending, well, I mean, I could just get a Galaxy. Same thing, same difference. And you're like, that's, that's not it anymore. We're doing something unique here. Bam. Uh Oh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I sucked all the air out of that one. I, I was very impressed with the short time that I got to to, to handle the phone. I just, I, this is, I, I'm a, okay, I'm a razor whore anyway, right? I mean, I love my blade. I freaking love my blade. So th there is a part of me that if anyone wants to walk into the space and do something different, I am so happy it's that weird funky snake logo. I just... This looks like it could be. It has so much potential. I get so excited about potential. I just want potential to be realized. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the excitement is real there. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I just fanboyed out a little there. I will say though, I, I, I'm more impressed with the device because I, I liked what this. You know, when Sia was on stage and he said, "Look." Um, you know, we wanted to get to that flagship status because, you know, as gamers, he's like, I, and he kind of, it, but it fits well with Razer, right? They, all their products feel, have that premium finish, whether it's the Razer blades, whether it's the accessories, you know, we, I mean, Sam, you have a couple of those as well, right? So, you know, you know what you get with Razer. So with the phone, the, they needed to get to that level of saying, okay, look, we've got everything that your premium phone does, but as a gamer, there's something you want, right? And, to your point with the display, just that 120 hertz is just the 
barrier of entry for you to say, okay, yes, this is a gaming device. We all know as gamers, when we want to buy monitors, you're like, ah, that refresh rate, ah, you know, right. you know, uh, is, is, is this, is this one MS, you know, how many Hertz is the screen, all this kind of stuff that most other people don't, don't get. But I, I, I finally got all of the pieces connected for proper G sync support. <laughs> you know? Like uh -oh. that stuff matters. It helps. Uh, it, like it's so silly, but it does. It just, it's so pretty. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. It, it definitely is. And I think they've done a really solid job. I like the improvements with the audio here. They said they've got a better, um, better processing with the uh, USB type C adapter there that they have. So I have to see how that pans out. They've got headphones that also are USB type C that you can buy. I can't remember how much that was. Um, that should give you better sound by from THX, which of course they own as well. Um, if you are an audio person, the THX intro sound is part of the ringtone as well. Uh, so you can just throw that in there on your phone. But I, so far, I like it. I like what they've done. And but they do have a different color that's in satin, and I think that one is just looks so much better. But but also, it's just some of the the little touches are things that I think a number of Android enthusiasts. This is not a phone targeted at general consumers. You get it so right when you're Razor and you go out there and you say, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want to customize your phone or if you want to mess with launchers and home screens and stuff like that, your phone comes preloaded with Nova. Yeah. So Nova. thank you. Um, Adid Tanel was, was asking about it. It's Nova <laughs> Prime. So, so you're getting your updates as whenever Nova rolls them out you know and because they know they don't they don't handle that they don't do software for for phones so Makes sense. i i just like from point to point to point the fact that they're they're making the flagship argument with unique hardware there is nothing else like it you know i get i get really lit up about something like uh lg in the quad dac it's not because it's just good there is literally nothing like it and that Razer is doing this at an $800 price point, that to me is, is an incredible commentary on what uh, a spunky upstart can do um, when it comes to competition in this space. And, and it's something I really, really hope people take seriously instead of just like, oh, it's 16 by 9 screen, so it's not, you know, I hate bezels. And you're like, again... You're really missing the point out of what this thing. But but you know it's fine though. I mean, he, he said it again. He was just he was on stage. He goes, "If you don't like bezels, forget it. Don't buy this phone." I was yeah. like, you know, finally, at least a CEO who's not bullshitting. I get it. You know, just say what it is. Like we don't do notches. We don't like notches because we think it's stupid. Or you know, is a bezel a unified notch? <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I mean, awesome. you just went, what is the sound of one hand clapping on us? Exactly. Like, you just went full philosophy. <laughs> so, so, but here's the thing. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Vega Valez says, Razer knows how to design a phone for gaming. Much better than what the Honor Play is, the Asus ROG or the Xiaomi Shop. You know, th so so I, I can't speak to the Xiaomi, and, and I unfortunately, I'm way behind on Honor. I'm hoping to catch up with the 8X. I just haven't handled any of their phones in a while. The one thing, that, so the, the exciting conversation here is, I think Razer is delivering the better phone as an argument for gaming over ROG. What's exciting about Asus is knowing Asus as a company. I mean, I just recently did four hours of conversation on Asus, Intel ninth gen, motherboards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's exciting about an ROG phone is ecosystem. I don't necessarily get as excited for that specific phone but Asus is making a huge argument for turning your phone into the next Nintendo Switch. And that's where I think these two companies are coming at opposite ends of the gaming spectrum. They're both making a very good argument for mobile gaming. I think they're both making killer arguments, but they are making different arguments. I think the Razer product looks cleaner, looks smoother, more refined, and I love that screen refresh rate. But the accessories package that Asus is delivering with ROG is extremely formidable. And I think as these two companies start facing off, that's where I think we'll get a really exciting ecosystem bump. Razer and Asus, ROG versus Snakes. That's that's an epic fight in any platform. That's an epic fight for laptops. 
Mm-hmm. It's an epic fight for desktops. That's going to be an epic fight for phones. Yeah. Uh, Adid says, Sam, you are woke as F. Dude, <laughs> you are woke the, AF, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. The bezel is a unified notch. <laughs> we need a stick on that. Yes. 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 It's time to make some t shirts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, but at the end of the day, though, I think um, Ray, I trust Razor more. I get what he's saying about um, Rog. I love Rog boards. I've been do a no, lot no, of my. No, no, can, no, actually, no, no. can I ask We don't on, love on, those on. boards anymore. No. no, no. <laughs> No, no, no. I actually, this, this, I'm, I'm really curious to, to, to understand this point um, from Sam. Why you trust Asus, I mean, why you trust Razer more than Asus. Razer acquired Nextbit, and this is only their second generation product, but Asus has been making Zenfone for years. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you, uh, but when it comes to basically just design of hardware, general design of hardware, I trust, uh, I trust Razer more because I've been with Razer from the original um, day they were making the Mamba all the way till now, and I've seen how they've improved. I've seen the kind of detail they put into making accessories and then into making computers and now into making phones. And I'm like, I trust Razer because I know they would put dedication into it. Um, I like what Asus is doing, but I've never used really an Asus, uh, Asus phone. I've just stayed away from Asus phone because mm-hmm. when it comes to um, builds with Asus, apart from their internals, for like their motherboards, I really don't depend on the suits for anything else. Even their screens, which are amazingly good, I don't get drawn to that. I get drawn more to like Acer um, screens. So it's it's one of those things. It's, it's like I've used both of them. I respect their um, their gaming. Uh, I would say uh, prowess. Prowess, or yeah, the, uh, I was I was going to say pedigree. They, they both have great gaming pedigree. But when it comes to something in my hand that I want to use to play games, I would trust Razer more because I just have that experience with them that once I take a Razer um, keyboard or a Razer mouse or a Razer mat, when I'm using any of those, I have no issues with them. I've always really enjoyed using their products when it comes to gaming. Um, But from a phone perspective, yes. This is a whole nother thing when it comes to like gaming for phones. And I think to me, the biggest part here is the cooling system they're putting in there. Yeah. Like how they're customizing their cooling. It sets them apart. Along with the screen, it sets them apart. And the whole idea that this is something that could potentially, you know, grow into another, like what, what they're calling it, like a flagship gaming device. It really goes into what we've been saying for a while, which is you're going to have that flagship work for like basically the road warriors. You're going to have that flagship just for the creators. And then you you are going to have that flagships for those guys who just want the game on the go, which basically, hey, I travel a lot. I have a laptop that does everything else, but I need something that keeps my mind engaged while I'm on that 16 hour flight. You know, this is going to be for those guys. Now- and. Now, sorry, just to quickly interject, think about all those streaming services, right, that we mm-hmm. just talked about. And you you have a display that's 120 hertz. And you're like, okay, I'm either using Xbox Cloud or NV- NVIDIA service or whoever it is. I'm now streaming on a device that has audio queued in. Not just some dinky speakers uh, in Adobe Atmos. They, they probably will add a gaming, you know, preference in there. I've got a display that kicks every other display's ass. Doesn't even matter on there. And granted, is everything is server side in terms of processing, but the experience is now tuned in to me holding this device, and I'm hearing and I'm viewing it the way that that game at least should have been on my large screen TV or on my desktop. So in, in addition to that, I mean, because I'm right there with you, and I think we can keep putting some of these pieces together, is Samsung should be making an argument for DeX. You buy a Note. I don't really care about Fortnite on the Note, but I love the idea of plugging in one cable and having a desktop-style... Bluetooth working. mouse and keyboard? So... I'm I'm doing a just a little comparison video for the V40, uh, just V40 versus V30. I like to talk about one year upgrades. Do companies yeah. make a good argument for that? I wrote the script by doing a screen share to my TV on a Chromecast and a little fold out keyboard and Bluetooth mouse and wrote everything in Microsoft Office without having decks, but I was still using 
a much larger display to get that work done all from the phone. Once we start putting those pieces together, better game streaming services, utilize something like Dex, but not for productivity software, but for gaming software. So it hooks up to your TV and then you have that streamless uh, you know, gaming experience. You can pull it back and forth. Razer has a portfolio of phenomenal accessories. Razer and Asus. I mean, Asus keyboards, I was using them on Thursday. Asus mice and keyboards are actually pretty nice too. Um, but once you have that whole ecosystem packaged, presented, ready to go, and you could do something really exciting like Razer with USB-C headphones for your phone that then connect to that Thunderbolt port on your Razer laptop, that's the seamless kind of ecosystem that Apple only used to be able to do, and now Apple can't even do. We could actually arrive there from gaming companies because of the stuff that they already do well. I, having an amazing broadcaster mic, right? You know, like uh, Razer has been putting out some pretty decent microphones lately. Step by step, piece by piece, we've got the entire package ready to go. And a phone can fit really well into that. Just like we only used to talk about gaming laptops and gaming desktops back in the day. Yeah, no, I think the, it's, it's like I said, it's a, it's a wild west for gaming right now, gaming hardware and services. It really is the wild west. And I really am um, looking forward to see how this really turns out. All right, cool. Good stuff. Speaking of uh, interesting hardware, uh, Samsung announced the Galaxy A9 that doesn't have just one or two, not even three, but four cameras in the rear. <gasps> So thoughts, guys. What do you think about the A9? It's a budget device, by the way. It's running a Snapdragon 636, I believe, or 660? 660 chipset. Yeah, yeah, the cameras are 120-degree ultra-wide angle, 8 megapixels, f-stop 2.4. Telephoto, 10 megapixels, f-stop 2.4. Main, 24 megapixels, f-stop 1.7. Um, and a depth camera, 5 megapixels, f-stop 2.2 live focus so i was i thought the telephoto was the one that would do that but i guess there are two i mean any thoughts one because i i was looking at it go if you've got a telephoto you don't need a depth camera but uh well no actually i i do think that there is there's some value in having dedicated hardware that matches the uh the main focal length um it's what i do like about huawei with monochrome Depth isn't quite the same as a good monochrome sensor, but you can use it for better lighting adjustments, better exposure adjustments, and then it should improve. Uh, it, it it should hopefully, I'm, I'm totally guessing here, but it should hopefully improve things like portrait mode from the main sensor. Mm -hmm. Portrait mode from the zoom sensor will always be compromised in lower lighting conditions, indoor lighting conditions, and at night. But if you fire up a Huawei and you use the wide aperture mode, you're using wide aperture from the main better light sensitive sensor. So a depth sensor paired to that focal length could be a benefit for some of those fun features. It's it's a lot of hardware to add for some of those fun features. But if you're going to do this, if you're going to make the argument and Samsung has been claiming that they're going to back off from delivering every new hardware improvement only to the Galaxy S series first and then let it filter down. Instead, they're gonna filter up from the mid range. Then I think this is the right way to start that conversation. You have the full focal length range that I have on an LG. And now you've also added one of the, uh, the fun feature pieces of hardware that I really like on uh, matched focal length sensors. I, I think that's a killer way to build a mid ranger. The 660 is an awesome chipset. I love it in my BlackBerry. It, it is plenty capable for getting a majority of your work done in a, in a fashion that doesn't feel painful or doesn't feel like you're compromised or laggy. It gets good battery life. And now adding fun consumer -y features to that and not just compromised mid-ranger hardware to that is an interesting way to attack the mid-range. See, my, my issue here is uh, playing with the V40. One of the things, you know, LG did was they had to add an extra ISP in there because of the three sensors they had. Mm -hmm. And um, and it showed. It, to me, it, my mind goes, 
The 845 is a great processor. The ISP is good. It's built for two cameras. It's not necessarily built for three. And I, that's, that's what I felt with my image in there. And then some people argue, well, but the P20 Pro has three. But my argument there is one is a monochrome and... Granted, the monochrome is being used. It also, when you switch, when you switch monochrome, you're you're solely using that sensor. So yeah. it treat it yeah, treats yeah. it as either or, right. you know. Yeah, in that case. So yeah. how is Samsung going to manage this that we have? For, you're, you're, right? Oh, you're not wrong. I, I do think that part part of what's going to happen here is complication and software services running on the mid range your phone. But it's just like, you know, Android doesn't have any stylus or Wacom digitizer support. So you just have to run a ton of extra services on top of Android for a note um, that that might lead. I, I, my hypothesis would would be is that it should lead to the 660 in a Samsung performing slower than the 660 in a more streamlined phone. But I also have every faith in Samsung as a camera company that they can develop custom firmwares and hardware support because they're they're pretty good at making cameras um especially delivering at the price tag that this phone's going to arrive at I, we should expect some compromises in performance but will that be enough to sour someone on a phone that has a unique feature a unique camera setup like this and that i don't think so i think i think they're gonna do fine i think the 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 compromises we're asking consumers to make will not be deal breakers they'll be deal breakers to tech enthusiasts You'll have YouTubers, you know, twisting their hair out and gnashing of teeth and underwear getting, you know, sucked up into butt cracks. But wow. the actual people who buy these phones and use these phones, I think that they're actually going to enjoy Samsung's solution for uh, for camera management. Sam, any thoughts? Um, no, not really. I think uh, four cameras on a phone seems overkill to me, but hey, um, wow. If it's a mid-range, I guess it's a, this is the right place to play around with features like this, right? Uh, let, let, let's see. Fun camera to have, right? Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a fun little, uh, you know, well, camera the, on the go. Sorry, the, 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 the last thing, and I, I space saying it before, the reason why depth sensor might be a better play here is you don't have the Qualcomm 800 series computational power for software features to take advantage of all of this stuff. Um, like I get pretty decent uh, portrait mode shots out of my BlackBerry Key 2. I actually have gotten some amazing photos of Lex at like restaurants in dim indoor lighting conditions from this BlackBerry, which supposedly has the worst camera of all time. Um, I really feel anyone who's still slamming the BlackBerry camera just doesn't know how to camera. Um, but when you step down to that 660, you lose a lot of the horsepower that you would have relied on for a Pixel or you would have relied on for a, a Galaxy S or, or an iPhone. And I think having something like that depth sensor helps fill in the gaps on something that you can't just make up in software. Sorry. No, sorry. No, that is that is very true. I, I That makes a lot of sense. Uh, OnePlus 60's uh, press event is now officially the 30th. It was initially supposedly going to be the 17th. But it looks like that's going to be it. Um, it look, and this word that it has a new, a new improved UI um, for for the device as a whole. So we'll see um, how that shows up. OnePlus fans, I'm sure, would be very excited for this new uh, device announcement. Although I'm still not, I I I don't like their timing. It's just too short from the OnePlus Six to the OnePlus Six T. It used to be good in the past because Qualcomm always had two chips a year. Now Qualcomm is just doing one processor a year. So I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so sour face. I, uh, I don't know. Um, Facebook. Announced... Oh, is that all we're going to say about the, the 60s? That... I mean, unless you want to say something, I'm sorry. I mean, like, yeah, if you, if you want to chime in. Um... I, I had a long conversation with TK about this as we were driving to lunch. And I don't know. I mean, like, how, how are you guys feeling? I. I feel like I, I I feel concerned and frustrated about things like the the headphone jack. Obviously, I'm gonna be cranky about that. But it doesn't seem to have moved the needle much at all with people talking about the phone. Like I, I feel if that were a bigger deal to consumers, we would have seen that vote with your wallet campaign now for people buying the one plus six instead of getting the six T. Yeah. No, I do agree. I think um, 
I think it, the end is truly near for the headphone jack. And then, you know, just speaking of that with rumors that Samsung most likely would take it out, or at least might take it out out of the S10 uh, because of bezel. And, and I have to see what the bezel looks like. If they truly give me that phone that looks like there's just no bezel, I hate it, but I'll forgive them because at least the excuse is valid. I just want a valid excuse. The excuse wouldn't be valid for Christ's sake. The screen does not basically go all the way to the end of the device. It sits on top of the damn device. I'm whatever. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. Uh, it depends I'm, on how you screen I'm with, is. I'm with Sam there. I know. I, I, I have taken the part. To make like, a bezel no, no, no. I'm saying not, not, not what Google said last year when they said the Google said they were doing thinner bezels. By the way, for this this crap here with that mm. super notch right mm -hmm. there, they said is they were that, doing mm. that's anime character. Um, no, but no, no. I, I was looking at the notch. I, I was just, I was just amazed. Can you can you swim in that thing? Yeah, it's pretty massive, though. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here we go. That's that's it right oh, there. Look at so that. gross. I just threw up in my just, mouth. Just, <laughs> so, they just give you guys a good idea of how it, it, how it looks as though they saw Iron you. Man and went, we can do that. I'm, yeah. I am so happy my dad has the smaller Pixel 2 and that he doesn't gonna need to shop a phone. No, it, this is, year. it is so bad. Uh, I was talking to, I saw Fisher and I was like, so which one do you pick? It's like, of course I went with the three. I can't go with that. It was just offensive. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> it, it I, is. I, I actually, I had another powwow session with my uh, my patrons, um, <laughs> patreon.com slash on the gadget guy. Uh, we, I, I'm gonna be sitting it out. I'm going to circle back to the Pixel 3 at the end of the year. There's just so much coming out this month, and everyone's way more excited to talk about Razer phones, OnePlus 6T, LG P40. Um, Honor to try and get another like entry-level phone or $200 phone in the mix, too. I will not be able to get to the Pixel 3 by the end of the year. I'm, I am completely booked. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not um it's it's a crazy time of the year just in terms of devices, um uh, to play around with. But uh, I think uh, this week's launch event was pretty nice. Uh, but like I said, back to Facebook, they announced a device called Portal, which is um, um, Sam, you want to kick it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it's my a video chat device. Basically, it's uh, two of them, right? There's one. For about, uh, I believe it's a hundred. Let's see, uh, there, one hundred ninety-nine, and there's another for three hundred forty-nine. Just imagine the, the same thing with the uh, the Google um, Hub, you know, the, the Google Home Hub, and um, Alexa, you know, the Alexa with the screen. Uh, what, what, what's that called now? Uh, <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah. It's essentially the same thing that you're doing there. I don't know exactly what the features are on that, but this is actually going to have Alexa on it. So if Facebook is launching a device that's going to use Alexa as its well, well, they don't. They don't assistant. have. They don't have their own voice assistant, um, and I don't think they're really going in that route. They want to have um, per assistance. I think that started off well, and then we corrupted one of their assistants. Mm -hmm. You know, they had no, the chatbot. Sorry. Uh, the AI chatbots got one of them got corrupted by people who like traded it the wrong way and became evil. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and remember they that they had that they they also realized that some of the chatbots started talking to each other and were using a different language that was created by but them, so they shut it down as well. <laughs> yep, they, they they literally created Skynet and they're like, we'll kill this before it goes any further. Yeah. So I think that's where probably where they, they want things to happen. And I kind of get that whole idea of the assistant goes to fetch out the things you want, the you know, set up, you know, if I wanna if I wanna hang out with Juan, I'm like, yeah, Juan, you know, I'm gonna be here, then his chatbot will clear his schedule so he can actually drive over and then I can see him instead of him making the excuse to say, Oh, I was so busy, I'm tired. I was so say, tired. Though. I fell yeah. asleep at like seven. <laughs> you know, like when you're when you're sort of a younger adult, you can be like, I'm going to stay up all night just because I can because I'm a grown up. You yeah. get a little bit older and you have a kid and you're like, I'm going I'm going to go eat the early bird special at my favorite <laughs> restaurant, go home and fall asleep at eight in comfy pajamas because I'm a grown up and I can do that. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's so funny. It's just like this the whole I want to stay up and party all night. I'm a grown up. I live alone. I can do this. And then there's the. 
I want to stay home and not go out because I'm a grown up and I don't have to be peer pressured exactly. into going out. <laughs> <laughs> And it is it is sort of a, a sort of a reinforcing echo chamber because like my wife will be the same way. Like I had a long day. Did you have a long day? Yeah. Do you want to try and get out of here? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so that's all we have to talk about the Facebook portal. It's a Facebook. Uh, but but the question I want to actually ask with this is um, I was talking to Danny about it, and I was like, "You got to cover it." He's like, "No, everybody hates Facebook." Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, that was just his just initial thoughts. Like, it's like because of all the stuff that's going on with Facebook, and I and even to the fact that with this breach announcement of twenty nine million hacks, people were like, "Oh, you know, Facebook again." They were just clarifying the information. And then looking at what GSM Arena posted here on this device, um, the article writes uh, at the very top. They go, "The portal uses an array of four far field microphones that records your conversation." Strike out picks you up your voice commands. That's a, But see, that's a sentiment that is, we all know happens for every single Yeah, but when, you, when you but the way it's written this many is, times, yeah. when you struck out this many times when it comes to consumer security, as Facebook has, you lose trust. You lose trust in your consumers, or your consumers lose trust in you that you're going to protect whatever you record from them. If someone is hacking your system, then you don't have a, 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 a full oh, no, no. solution I, 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 I How do I know it. you're not going to get my conversation? No, no, no. I get, I get that part. I just don't want, and hey, Ricky, if you're watching this, you guys shouldn't just write it this way. You know, you know, this is, this is a little, uh, a little bit too much satire for me just knowing that it's got four ray mics. You know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah, know. We, we used to have a lot of those debates in pocket now too. You're trying to write entertaining content. And you know, the, I, I feel, I personally feel, and, and Jaime, I think, would have agreed with me too, that oftentimes when you inject that much sardonic wit, I think that crosses the line into editorializing on something. And I, I feel there should always be a clear separation between editorializing and delivering news. But, but what I, what I, what I want to try and, and offer up here, guys, is... Uh, and, and please tell me what your thoughts are, because I know we're getting close to wrapping up this podcast and I can be really long winded. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it seems like Facebook has become a lightning rod company for a general trend that I'm seeing throughout the tech industry where we're all burnt out. We're all tired of social media. We're all tired of toxic conversations, toxic interactions online. And we're all looking to improve the quality of interactions that we have, you know, from Google and Apple. Um, it's we're going to build these apps that nanny monitor all of your phone usage. And we'll tell you when you're using apps too much, young sir, you sit your butt down, um, which I think are just going to create more noise. I think they're going to be things that people think are nifty for a minute and then disable because they're just getting nagged about what they're already going to be doing on, on their phones anyway. But we look at an outlet like Facebook and that becomes such a lightning rod because its business model sort of encourages the most outrage traffic, the most toxic behavior. Wrapping all of this up now, do we think that this general trend will actually find some legs as we talk about digital health and digital mental health? Or are we just taking a little bit of a break, you know, letting a few of these Facebook products go by and then we'll start tagging back into whatever social media trend becomes hot next week or something like that. I, I, th I think we're taking a bit of a break. I, I think the way uh, at least our society runs with social media is unless somebody comes up with either a platform or a service or something that's new, really fresh and really curtails some of the things that we wanted to curtail, there is no way people will change. As much as people I've noticed, people have complained and talked about it. And then and I watch them. They're also part of the problem. You know, they are the ones who are doing some of the same things. And they're the ones who complain about people posting too much. And then I'm going, why did you post that? And I think it almost because social media had never had instructions or manual or <laughs> how to. There was no you best know, practices. There was no, there was no best practice. You know, there's no consumption of saying, hey, look, if I'm going to share anything on any platform, that means I'm sharing to 6 billion people or 7 billion people, sorry. That's, that's literally how you should look at it. If I put this picture up, 7 billion people have access to it. 
that's and but the, the thing is we never had a best practice or there was nothing taught in schools or our parents would say son when you sign up on facebook well you know, it's, it's just even remember worse this. than that because um i recently got in a situation where i, I had to do some research for my uh, sister-in-law uh, about my nephew trying to um you know kind of curtail his posting habits and i found out that you really can't even do that as a parent you do not even have a child Instagram account that you can basically lock or basically review any post before it goes out there. That doesn't exist. <laughs> so it's like, no, they just, they want to collect as much information as possible. Yeah. And they don't want to be limited in any way, shape or form with regards to people's personal safety or the safety of minors. They don't care about that. All they care about is getting as much information as possible and selling it to the people who buy this information from them. Yeah. It's, it's scary. It seriously is scary. I mean, I mean, just look at it this way, and I'm not trying to interject politics here, but I was reading something before we got online saying the Trump campaign is now selling its the information data of it, you know, uh, people who signed up. And, you know, the- Oh, gosh, dang it. I need to now go and sign up from it. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, but it didn't disclose this to the users. It just came out with this article, and you know there are many services that do that. And you're going, how do I not know about these things? And how do I not know that? Okay, I am yeah, signed up for whether it's a service, a political organization, anything like that. That I want to, that I know it's only curtailed into that service itself. We live in a day and age where it, look, once you sign up for something. Is gone. If it has, a, if if it's on the web, it is gone. You know, and you know because that person would sell that information to someone else who would sell it to someone else, and then when I, you finally get that email and say, "Don't send me any more emails," you're saying it to the last person, person. in the world that got your information, but the person who sold it in the first place still has access to it. It's I, like. I, I I try to keep my information that I sign up for the same across the board. So you 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 buy that's 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 my own thinking. You you're buying the same information that I want out there as much as possible. Again, it's it's so hard to do, but uh, I think that's this thing people have to realize is that the only way for you to control your information, a runner call and says turn it off. Yes, or yeah. or you you decide what you share. Yeah, yeah, but even that even is, so, that is, that's that's it, the most. It, it, there's sometimes you don't even share information, and it gets out there anyway. Yeah. Um, recently, uh, I'm helping a friend out. We're removing information about her on the internet because she's somewhat of a public figure. Uh, people know her name, and she works in a sensitive kind of industry. Now, all of a sudden, her phone number and her address and the last three addresses were online. <laughs> You can actually search and find these things online. And she's like, I never posted this anywhere. And I'm like, yeah, it could be the fact that, you know, when you did an address chain in the post office, someone might have gotten the hang of it. Or when you basically filled out something online for like a payment or something, someone, you know, took that and used it to, um, you know, to, to sold it to, to, to a third party. We now know that when you gave Facebook your phone number for two-factor authentication, they basically sold that information, used that information to deliver ads to you. So nothing is sacred anymore when it comes to these social media companies. Nothing really is sacred anymore. So the question becomes like, what what is your right as a consumer to basically say, I don't want certain information about myself to be out there? especially information that I give to one social media company. I don't want them to sell this information. I, I don't want any one of this kind of information to get out there whatsoever. Uh, th that becomes like a really interesting question. What, I, 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 I think the advent of a subscription service for social media might be advantageous, where I know that I am not servicing ads i am using this I, i'm not saying it's going to work perfectly or anything i'm just saying that that might be something and then if if my information actually gets sold at that point or is is you know is, is i find out that facebook has done something with it then i have rights to sue right now we don't have again even on the litigation side right unless of course it's those big class actions we're looking at uh yeah and even then, hacks, you, yeah. that just becomes a, a business tax it's exactly really yeah. something that corrects the industry Thank yep. you. But when you're paying for a service, then you can literally say, hey, look, I paid specific for this. I'm, I'm holding paying, you to that. Standard. Yeah, I'm paying the premium. It's the hundred dollars, you know, a year to say, you don't use my stuff and then you use my stuff. So 
Sorry. And and that that's also one of those things too, where until we can get to some type of agreement or change the uh, the relationship that we have with these companies, I mean, to Ronald Collins's point in the live chat, I I, I am a digital twenty first century consumer. The power button doesn't really get turned off. <laughs> I can't. But, I got to order from Amazon, man. <laughs> but this is this has become a major part of my since having Lex over the last three years. A major part of my tech relationship has been changing my behavior. That has been, for whatever reason, we act like consumers can't ever change their behavior. But again, there are maybe six or seven photos of Lex on Facebook. And only a couple of them have her face visible in any kind of identifiable fashion. There are over 120 gigabytes of photos and videos of Lex available to my family and friends but none of them on any kind of public facing platform. It's all in a locked up folder on another cloud server. Is that the safest? No, but that is a much higher tier um, separation from social media while still being accessible to the people that care enough to kind of keep up with our family's exploits. It was another thing too. I was really disappointed. Obviously I made a, a video about the iPhone and it was really snarky, but I detailed in the video how I was changing my behavior and using the iPhone to streamline interactions and to get to the services that were important and to try and minimize the amount of time I spend picking up my phone looking for something to do. Obviously, I made a video about the iPhone, so most people went, oh my gosh, if you just don't like it, then just don't buy it. I'm over the haters. Um which you're obviously not over the haters if you're leaving comments on my video while <laughs> amazingly missing the point of what the video was about. But this is something that I've been trying to play with for almost four years now. Uh, it started when I did the experiment of turning my phone grayscale. So I turned my phone black and white. How can I minimize unhealthy interactions with my phone? Where we all do this, we pick up our phone with the intention of doing one thing, and then thirty minutes later, we're looking for something else to do. Oh yeah, I find thirty that, minutes later, we still haven't done that one thing—the one thing that we were supposed to be doing. Doing to do. Yeah, exactly. I am currently <laughs> so, doing that right now. So I find I find Apple's argument is wholly disingenuous when they're talking about screen time, because iOS is still a flea market, bizarre of apps that just install with very poor organizational tools for the user. And, and the only way I, way I could wrap my head around a simpler interaction and organizational layout was to try and make iOS look a little bit more like Android so I could dump everything into an app drawer folder. And then I use my iPhone more like I use Windows 10, where instead of looking through pages of apps, I search for exactly the app that I want to use in that moment and that way I'm not looking for, I'm not getting distracted by pretty colorful squares. I'm going directly to that one interaction with purpose so I can get on with my day. Until we have these kinds of relationships, what you were saying and what we've been saying, you know, having a, sus a subscription style Facebook as opposed to a I'm the product Facebook, it's going to be on us to change our behaviors and then also be those resources for our family and friends to help them change their behaviors. Almost every single person I've shown my iPhone to, I have one home screen and I have a folder down in the dock where all of the apps have been dumped. Everyone I've shown that to, as opposed to having categories of folders and multiple places where they're putting things, there's been some appeal there. Not all of them are going to switch over to my to my layout. Oh, I am going to do that right but now. But something clicks, some, it makes sense. There is a problem with how we interact with our technology. This is my solution for it. It's not going to be everybody's solution for it, but I, I can make a good argument for why I'm doing this, not just to spite Apple. And there's been a lot of traction in my own personal circles of family and friends that something needs to change, but that change isn't going to come from the company because the company is being validated with every purchase. So instead, I'm going to have to be the change and then that will probably influence future purchasing decisions. Yeah, totally, totally agree, Ben. Um, but I, the, the whole folder thing for me is just about being organized. I, I hate flipping through things and having to do yep. the search bots. So what I do is I basically, totally. with, with my Samsung, put them in folders, 
color the color the uh, the folders I use the most. So basically, when I when I'm looking for something, I just know I associate it with a color, pop open the folder, totally use the app and the story. It's and, and, changing. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and color is so huge. When yeah. you go black and white, it is shocking. You don't really look for iconography. You were only looking for little smudges of color to get to the apps that you're familiar with. It completely pumps the brakes on how you used to look for things on your phone, even when you know that your apps are alphabetically sorted. But again, why, why I was focusing that conversation on Apple and why I'm so frustrated with Apple's, we're going to be so altruistic and give you these amazing reporting tools on screen time and how you use your phone um, are things like when I organize folders and home, and home screens and launchers on Android, I can create exactly the layout down to the ergonomics of how I hold my phone. Like something as simple as I will put a shortcut for my wife exactly where my thumb naturally rests on the screen, but I can't do that on an iPhone. An iPhone always has to be a grid arrangement from the top down. So I always have to organize exactly in that form factor. When I want to put folders together on an iPhone, the fastest way to organize the folders is to go through <laughs> iTunes. Look, I need another computer to do the basic folder organization and management. Now he tells me I'm home. struggling here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess. This is a thousand and, 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 and it's not just it's not just argument iOS. covering the basics. It's, it's not just iOS, it's also Android. Android oh, even, Android has problems, but yeah. Android by design started with better tools. Oh yeah, it had better tools to manage. But the stuff. thing is, like, I would like to be able to say, "Hey, when I download an app, it doesn't automatically show. I, I, I don't want it to automatically show up on my front page. Now I have to go through and click an option that says, oh, don't install this on the front page.' I think it might be a Samsung thing, it might be an Android thing, but it just automatically goes right there on my home yeah. screen. So it's I like, if, if you don't pay attention to that." you end up with a clusterfuck of a situation. Yeah. No, I actually, I actually like that because my home screen uh, is only the apps that I use. I leave there. So I literally, and I, I need to have one home screen page with only one app so I can see my wallpaper. I got to look at that wallpaper. See, my, my, my home screen is for two things. First off, it has my calendar. And secondly, it has that bottom bar with email, messenger, phone icon, and what's the last one? And camera. Uh, camera, exactly. That's it. <laughs> that, that, that's all my home screen is. I, so I used to be that guy who would have like, I, I remember when I was setting up my rugby and how excited I was that I could have seven home screens on my little Samsung rugby. And I'm now I'm down to two. I'm down to two home screens just for sort of key, key services, a clock. And then uh, some of my favorite multimedia apps. And for 2019, my my goal is to get it down to one, one home screen. I want as streamlined an interface, as simplified an interface as I possibly can. That can be instantly translated from phone to phone to phone to phone. And that's that's my goal. For, uh, Ron did not tell me how difficult this is to do it. It's, it's a pain in the ass, right? It oh, just works. Uh, Jesus, not Christ. at all. It pisses me off so much. And again, I make a video about this where. I showed what I did and I explained why, but I had a, 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 a an army of over it. Just don't buy it. Ignore uh, the haters. IOS. So now I'm realizing that Apple has a lot of utility apps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I did the same thing for my, uh, my iPad. It was like organizing my iPad. And the fact that when you drag an app over, it's like, oh, it doesn't do it the first yeah. time. I'm like, dang it. it. That, oh, the drag <laughs> cost is just terrible. Yeah, no, it can be a little frustrating. It can be a little I'm, I'm, I'm consistently disappointed that over 11 why, why, years. Why was I listening to, to Juan on this shit? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, I think it's at this point we need to wind down. Yeah, and probably, yeah. Actually, I do need to get going here in just a couple minutes. But, All right, yeah. cool. So we've got to the part of the show while I continue this. Juan tells us exactly what's on his channel and what we can expect next so, week. So actually not a lot went to the channel over this last week because the iPhone is also a terrible platform for managing multimedia content. And uh, I lost two whole days of file management and file transferring just to get all of my camera samples off of the iPhone XS because I have PCs. And this wasn't a problem with one PC. I couldn't manage files on three different PCs. So this is not 
one just has a funky computer. This was a systemic problem that I faced with iOS devices. And the only way to fix it is to buy like a $3,000 Mac, which I'm not going to do. Success. Um, you did it. <laughs> so um, on, on, on the Patreon, I have the iPhone XS and the iPhone camera review. The camera review went live yesterday. It's 30 minutes, 4K, 60 frames per second. Um, you get the, the closest I could del I could deliver for native representation of iPhone camera samples. And we take a stupid deep dive into image processing, the capabilities of this camera, the claims that Apple's making, and that new larger image sensor. Patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Come into the main channel. I'm finally going to be getting back on track now that I'm not having to deal with iOS nonsense anymore. Um, I, I've been breaking in my V40. I have a couple days of photography under my belt here. We're going to be talking about audio capabilities. That's going to be another audio review that's going to be coming to the channel. And I'm, I'm working right now on a comparison. I always like looking at one year upgrades. So from my V30 to the V40, what should you expect? Will it be the right fit for you? Is it worth spending that kind of cash if your V30 is still kicking, still, still going strong? Um, and then uh, on Newegg, we, last week we did a ton, a ton of commentary on Intel 9th Gen 9900K. We had JJ from ASUS to give us like this crazy long um, in-depth breakdown on all of the new tech that's coming, not only to the Intel chipset, but to uh, ASUS motherboards. So that was, I mean, like that was granular. We were getting into like the trenching design on, on motherboards to talk about like uh, electron leakage and voltage uh, regulators and heat sinks and stuff. So yeah. if you really want to know, we'll tell you. Um, and then uh, over this weekend, I'm also going to be uh, delivering another episode of Creator Chat uh, with um, one of my favorite people on the planet. And uh, she shares a lot of her thoughts on creator burnout and making transitions between different media um, media setups. So I'll save that just for when I can properly tease it because I'm going to be editing that as soon as we're, uh, we're, we're done with this episode here. Cool. Good stuff. Um, on my end... We had a bunch of videos uh, this week, not too much. Uh, one is my best noise canceling headphones for 2018. This is between the uh, Bob Wilkins PX, granted they came out last year, uh, the Bose QC35 II, and the Sony Mark III, 1000 Mark III. So that's something to go ahead and check out to see, uh, which actually takes that claim for all the aspect that deals with uh, noise canceling. Uh, and then we just had uh, two other videos. Uh, one was on the Razer phone, talked about the top five features on that phone, um, what you can expect from it. And then we did a gaming video on the Pixel 3 XL. So what uh, uh, you, know, you can do with the Pixel 3 XL, does it overheat? You know, especially since it doesn't have a cooling pipe like many other devices do, and also runs four gigs of RAM. And even though that tech tends to run game well, there's some games that actually use more. So go ahead, check it out. As for next week, um, I'm going to be doing my speaker test uh, for all the new phones, including the Razer phone, which Razer claims at 103 decibels uh, is the peak, as well as also the new Pixel 3 XL. I will tell you there is a surprise king. That's all I have to say. Because LG has won this constantly. So mm -hmm. yeah, just put Very it out there. Interesting. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm going to have other videos. I just can't think of what I, I need to actually put out. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, Daniel will be covering uh, the stuff from Huawei at the event in London. So stay tuned for videos from him on the... Of course, the Mate 20 Pro and the Mate 20 itself. So there you have it, guys. Uh, thank you very much for chiming in the chat. I know we've gone extra long this week, but we went into a lot of philosophical discussions while I was trying to organize my apps. And <laughs> I think we we hit the nail on the head there. But uh, definitely check out all the channels here. Starting off, of course, with Mr. Warren Bowman from BW1.com. He's not here right now. But you can check him out on YouTube, BW1.com, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as also his website, BW1.com. And then Mr. Juan Bagnell is some gadget guy here on YouTube. 
You can follow him there. You can also follow him on all other social networks, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, as some gadget guy. You will also find him in the future with his Instagram videos on Instagram TV as some gadget <laughs> guy. And he has a show at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Thursdays on Newegg with Trisha Hirschberger. It is the Newegg Now show, I believe, right? Is yeah, that what's Newegg Now. Yeah. Newegg.com slash Newegg Now is the now. place to find it. Um, and uh, he has some really uh, good commentary there. Uh, and of course, the one and only black iron underscore man, Sam, who is not wearing any black attire at all. No, I mean, nothing black. No, nothing yeah. black today. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of weird, but you can find him as uh, Black Iron underscore Matt on Twitter and Instagram, and then myself. It is Board at Work on YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, as well as also our website. We have a new series on Facebook, uh, which we do weekly, uh, which is just a right now. It's a roundup of awesome tech every week. So go ahead and check that out um, because that's something we're trying to do more on Facebook. Uh, and again, thank you very much, guys. Subscribe to all the channels and. Always enjoy your entertainment. Bam.